The Dying Breed Movie Club Meets the Movies with your host, Phil Congleton. Guest starring Chris Mitch, Jeff Congleton, and Russ Fama. Special commentary by Corey Octus and Randy Petrus. Music by Garth Ivan. Additional music by The Subterraneans featuring Russ Fama, John Sweeney, Jim Bolno, and Joe Bronzecheck. Directed and edited by Phil Congleton. Episode 5. The Serious Side of Jerry Lewis, Part 1. Greetings from the Hedgerow Culbertson Run Clubhouse in Guthriesville, Pennsylvania. My name is Phil Congleton. First, let me introduce my guests. Our returning champion. <laughs> he is the guy who inspired us to do this kind of audio podcast format, thanks to his own ingenious audio blog series entitled Digging Star Wars, not to mention an accomplished writer, producer, director, Mr. Chris Mitch. Wow. Woo! Thank you for your kind And we have two rookies for our podcast this time. Uh, first, not only is she our first female guest to our podcast, yes. but she also is an excellent <laughs> photographer and is well versed in the TV production world. And she is someone near and dear to my heart, my little sister, Jennifer Jeff Congleton. Yay! And our second rookie guest, he is a veteran contributor to the television production industry and a huge Jerry Lewis fan, Mr. Russ Fama. Thank you, thank you, yes. thank you. Pleasure to be here. So how is everybody doing? Uh, great. Well, excellent. Today we are tackling a subject that might be a little difficult. During the uh, Billy Crystal podcast, we were um, talking about the movie Mr. Saturday Night, and Jerry Lewis has a great cameo in that movie. Oh, yeah, so uh, uh, you brought up the idea of we got to do a Jerry Lewis one. Well, I got nervous about doing too much comedy this year, so uh, I thought, why don't we try and tackle it a little different way and see if we could find the serious side of Jerry Lewis. And later on in the podcast, we will revisit our Episode 4 Avengers podcast and talk about Spider-Man in honor of the release of The Amazing Spider-Man in theaters a few weeks ago. For me, growing up, I uh, I was always a big fan of comedy teens, so I immediately gravitated to Martin and Lewis. Uh, I, as you know, I think Dean Martin was one of the coolest dudes ever to walk the earth. So uh, I immediately started to love Martin and Lewis, um, and then I kind of fell off with a lot of Jerry's solo stuff. It wasn't until like the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, that I really started to get into his stuff. I mean, some of his later stuff, like uh, she and I are a big fan of Cracking Up. Oh my, that's the first one that I that's, ever saw. That's, it, we've seen that a lot of times, and of course, The Nutty Professor and a few others, you know. But uh, it wasn't until uh, we started the Dying Breed Movie Club that I started watching uh, a lot of his more solo things that he has done. So, but I know Jerry really well. I read one of his books. Yeah, yeah, yeah I wrote. I read a book. Yes, I read a book. Was it King of Comedy? It was the one. The, it was King of Comedy. Yeah. Like semi-autobiography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an awesome book. I really yeah. enjoyed. I think it's Dean and Me. It came out a few years back, and and it goes back to the 500 Club uh, in Atlantic City, and it's pretty much all about Atlantic City those years. It's, it's a great, easy read, mm -hmm. and I just just recently uh, read it like for the third time. Nice. And you're actually pretty new to Jerry Lewis, right? Well, no, not necessarily. The first movie I ever saw was Cracking Up. You had it on VHS. I was like a little kid. Mm -hmm. So funny. Mm -hmm. I mean, a and, kid and, would and, of and, course find it. And for being one of his late but, films, it was so funny, yeah, which yeah. is surprising. Yeah. Um, and I was, when you were saying earlier about the decision to do the serious side of Jerry Lewis, when you told me that, I was kind of like, huh. No, I don't like the No, tr that. trust me, everyone but, I've spoken to is like, he has a serious side. I'm like, well, we're going to find out. But I'm so glad that you did that because I really, you know, there really is a lot there. Mm -hmm. there he does have a very serious side. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and There's definitely a demon inside in there, definitely. And, and, very, and, very yeah, serious. Yeah. Uh, Totally. You can really see it in King of Comedy, but... Oh my god. He, like, doesn't smile. Mm-hmm. Exactly. He just has this I-hate-the-world look on his face the whole time. I've been fascinated with Jerry Lewis probably ever since uh, my mom made me wear white uh, socks with black sandals. Uh, <laughs> open toe. And 
and and, and it was that kind of juxtaposition that like the comedy thing of re in reality like everyday reality that and and just you know always being um uh, in our family and just a bunch of comedians in a barrel trying to buy for attention um the whole slapstick thing really hit home at a very early age and jerry lewis obviously when he went solo was was king of that and which he took so much obviously from from the silent uh, era, but but in our era it was like brand new mm -hmm. and um, pre cable and all that it was there really wasn't much happening uh, mm -hmm. because I guess his when I was growing up his big you know feature films weren't mm -hmm. happening but he was on high rotation on the three channels that were left or UHF even better yeah where, and so um, uh, it was always like. There's a Jerry Lewis movie on. Mm -hmm. What? What? And everybody just like, mm -hmm. I, you know, my cousin will call me. Right? Whenever there was, it was like a Jerry Lewis sighting. Yeah. And we didn't even yeah. know if he was even alive at all, other than we when we started, you know, you know, getting uh, a little bit more worldly, uh, the whole MDA mm -hmm. connection, and then it, it almost became. Um, it wasn't only uh, Labor Day. We were celebrating kind of Jerry Lewis Day. It was really odd uh, when uh, I guess it was in the '80s when uh, Hardly Working. I was like, uh, and and I was just like, oh my god, this is great! I, it's on a big. I've never seen a Jerry Lewis mm -hmm. movie on a big screen. Here's my chance. And my brother and I, we go, and we're like the only ones in the audience in Center City, Philly, and we're like, why isn't yeah. why is this place packed? I, right. And I, and and I was roaring yeah. laughing. Mm -hmm. I was, and so to this day, it's still one of my favorites. Love hardly working. That's the interesting thing about this is Jerry hit his heyday. Before we were born, you know, pretty mm -hmm. much, yeah. and um, started to fall apart as we got older because you know that whole uh, only the French like him and blah 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 blah, and, and most people get annoyed with him and things like that. And it's like um, uh, when Harley Working came out, it was like uh, it was like it was almost taboo to go see. I guess so, yeah. And um, I was in the whole punk rock thing at that time, mm -hmm. which is ironic, Jerry. As under he he actually went underground again, so he was taboo. He was so it, it kind of made sense with the mentality I was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, against right. the grain. Yeah. It was hip to, mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. to see Jerry Lewis because I was into the whole. Yeah, you know, but it's interesting that we between the three of us so far, our favorites are hardly working and cracking up. Well, I, wait, I, gotta, <laughs> I mean, wait. I, I guess it's not your favorite. No, but I'm I saying. guess one of them only because it's closer. To home, maybe, and, and yeah, so that, in, that's in a lot a good of way ways, and maybe in, home, yeah. in the more seeing it on the big screen. Mm -hmm. But I mean, Nutty Professor, I mean, I mean, classic, probably numero uno. It's required watching. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah. I, exactly, yeah. my favorite. I mean, it really hit home. That movie. I mean, grew up with it, watched it millions of times, own it. But it really hit home. I was in Italy, and it was like a drizzly night, and, and it was after I guess the bars had closed. It had to be you know after two a.m. And um, I was walking down this little street, and there was a, I guess, uh, like a movie store, or TV store, something, you know, entertainment type shop. And the only thing they had on was was a Jerry Lewis movie mm -hmm. on a little TV, and they were running Nutty Professor. But now, mind you, there's no sound because I'm looking through a window. They just had the visual there. Mm -hmm. I couldn't. I watched the whole movie through the. <laughs> In it the rain. It's really like beautiful. Yeah, and, like, yeah. in the rain. And you're still Italy, laughing. Through a window, mm -hmm. silent mm -hmm. movie. And and then it, it occurred to me only after, I guess, when I owned it and he does the commentary, how close he was with Stan and Laurel. And, yeah. and mm -hmm. that made watch Jerry. Together. So, my advice to anybody watch any Jerry Lewis movie with the sound off. Yes. Mute it. And it's still hilarious. I'm here. Look like a lunatic in Italy right. in the rain in the middle of the morning, laughing, staring at a window, watching a, a movie through a TV, mm -hmm. silent awesome. Jerry mm -hmm. Lewis, mm -hmm. and it, it just held through. It was great. I'm, I'm I know you're nuts about Jerry Lewis. I am, but but to to Ross's point, and uh, like that's why out of all Jerry Lewis films, I, again the Nutty Professor is like what you have to see. But my personal favorite is The Bellboy. Mm. I love that movie. That's and a good one. It's shot entirely on location in Fountain Blue, Florida, back in its heyday. Um, and Jerry, of course, plays a bellboy. And it's mainly a silent film. And it's a, a whole series of scenes and gags that tie this loose snare thread through it. And, it's, and like I said, there is audio, but it plays like a silent film. 
And um, the my all-time favorite bit in that film is when Jerry Lewis himself arrives at the hotel. Mm-hmm. And of course, when Jerry Lewis shows up, he's your typical Hollywood star jerk. Like he's mm-hmm. like constantly like chain smoking and and he's, he's trying to be polite, but like because there's a model of people, the, the celebrity, the bad celebrity comes out. Uh, it, it's just a, it's a great film. Um, is that when the car, when they're all coming out of the car? Yes. Yeah, that, <laughs> there's like 30 people that come out of the car. Classic scene. And um, what was the one we watched for the movie club? The one where they're in, he's in with the, the girls' school? Oh, um, uh, Ladies' Man. Ladies', ladies man. man. Ladies' Man. Right. Ladies' Man, right. yeah. That yeah. was really interesting. Yeah. yeah, it was more of a technical achievement, yeah. if you ask me. I mean, um, I, I the, like some of the jokes just went way off the rails, I thought. Well, I always liked his selection of music. Was it the Ray Anthony big band? Always right. loved. I mean, hard hitting swing. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and like really, Cinderella's classic. Yeah, yeah. Like and fast. which was, and that kind of wasn't hip at the time because that was, I guess, uh, 50s and rock and roll and all that. And right. he really uh, held on to that um, big band swing, but. It was so hard hitting. Ah, Jerry, isn't it wonderful to get back to Hollywood? Yeah, Dean. Gee, I enjoyed those trips on the Super Chief. When we went east, I lay in my berth and listened to the wheels go, Jerry Lewis, Jerry Lewis, Jerry Lewis, Jerry Lewis, Jerry Lewis, Jerry Lewis. Well, that was very flattering of him. What did the wheels say on the return trip? Jerry Lewis, Jerry Lewis, Dean Martin. Jerry Lewis, Jerry Lewis, Dean Martin. If you don't know the backstory of Martin Lewis, you should read it because it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. He he basically discovered Dean. He worked yeah. the deal. He, mm-hmm. he did, and it's kind of legend now. He did most of the work. They worked in supper clubs. It, it, it's it's just amazing. And then you know when they when their breakup happened in Hollywood, it's hard for I think people of our generation to truly appreciate mm-hmm. how earth shattering that was. That was like the Beatles breaking up. Mm-hmm. It was it was major. And of course, Dean Martin went on to have a great career and do his thing. Mm-hmm. And. And Jerry went on, and and when Jerry went on, he not only continued making films, and I don't mean starring in them, he made films. He became an accomplished filmmaker. He revolutionized a lot of stuff. He invented video assist. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. Like, Jerry Lewis came up with that idea Mm -hmm. to strap a video camera to the side of the film camera so it could watch takes. He invented a handful of stuff. A ton of stuff. He taught at Southern Cal. He taught Steven Spielberg. Mm -hmm. He taught George Lucas. He taught. He's a genius. He Mm -hmm. is. And, and like, I know it's kind of like, and, like, like, you saying that, I totally agree, and that's kind of like the joke because people are like, oh, yeah, friends. Mm -hmm. No, he is a genius. Mm -hmm. He really is and, and he had such a crazy hard work ethic. He was cutting Cinderella mm-hmm. in his dressing room when he was doing shows mm-hmm. in Vegas. Did he get a heart attack at the end of that? He or broke his back that? and that's yeah. what led to the whole mm-hmm. mm-hmm. set yeah. addiction and mm-hmm. all that. Mm-hmm. I mean just an amazing story and I, I was fortunate enough to see him perform live in Damn Yankees in Philly. Oh wow. And oh my gosh, like one of the like highest points of my entertainment life was being able to be like I'm I'm in, I'm a hundred feet from Jerry Lewis. Like mm-hmm. this is so crazy. This poor guy is acting. The guy's acting inside, alongside Jerry Lewis. Flubbed the line, and he flubbed the line, and he couldn't remember his line. And Jerry stood there and put his hands on his hips. They're like, "I'm not going to tell you the line. You got to come up with it yourself." Which, of course, the house burst out. This guy was sweating, and Jerry's like, "Fine, I'll tell you the line." And then he turned. He said, "Say it like this," and he said the guy's line. And then the guy said it. Like, okay, great, we can go on. And I remember, you know, my wife at the time, she said. So mean and whatever. I said, but you know what? It was funny, and he didn't leave the guy out the dry. Like you know what I mean? Like it wasn't like he just stood there and waited for him, got angry. Mm-hmm. He turned into a bit, and I think that's what a great comedian or a great artist can do. They can they can seize yeah. a moment that they didn't anticipate, that they didn't plan, mm-hmm. and realize this can be funny. And to kind of what we're talking about here, funny is also sad and tragic. And mm-hmm. I think when you read King Comedy and about Jerry's life. A lot of tragedy in that yeah. guy's life. Pain and comedy yeah. go hand in hand. It's amazing. And so it's kind of cool that you're doing the serious mm-hmm. side. Because even though you're doing this, the serious side, you know, these films, as, as, as um, heavy as it can be at points or, or as deep as they're trying to be at points, there's still comedy inherent in there. And, and um, sometimes uh, I think Jerry just can't help but be Jerry. Yeah. You know, that makes sense. It's okay to be forgiving of people who after a certain amount of time get tired of the whole hey lady thing right, right, all sure. the time all the time but you gotta have a level of respect i mean this dude did so much for hollywood right and it's just it's just so important to remember that and i and i think i think that comedy drive that he has and whatever like it's uh, it's intoxicating 
Jerry makes a really great uh, point in this book that he almost had a jealousy for Dean Martin in, this, in the early years. It's all like back in the 40s. And because he said he, he would show up and no rehearsal, no nothing, and just be great. Mm -hmm. And when Jerry had to rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and write and rewrite and rewrite, and Jerry was such a fanatical workaholic type A, like perfecting everything, and Dean would just show up and be great. And he said, and he was always like, jealous of that. And that's why they made a great uh, uh, partnership because here is this this uh, 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 guy who's, who's totally. Uh, he doesn't give a crap. That's that. That's the, the phrase uh, uh, that, that Jerry gave uh, Dean when they were actually both trying to make it. Yeah. It was interesting how how well, Jerry was so overly workaholic and overly analytical, and and that shows through if you dissect all his movies and the inventions and all of his mm -hmm. later career. The start of it was. With Dean, I guess uh, and Dean kind of rode that so easily, mm -hmm. and he made his own career. And if you deconstruct Dean Martin's career, it's it's just as important in the sense that he just walked on and was great. Mm -hmm. He walked in the studio and sang great. He walked on a TV set mm -hmm. and it just it had a spark. And, mm -hmm. and like uh, he and he was well, a hit TV series, and I, I, movies didn't have to do yeah. much. Well, but Jerry really. It was always like this, this uh, working, work, work, work yeah. and, yeah. and, 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 and constantly crafting. Yeah. So it, it was almost like Dean was the natural and Jerry was the, the, the genius who was constantly couldn't rest, mm -hmm. just couldn't keep still, and yeah. just had to keep working. Mm -hmm. It was the best thing for them to split. Exactly. Because, because well, it, had, I, it was inevitable. Yeah, I mean, I like Martin Lewis flicks, but I like Jerry Lewis films better. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I enjoy them. More. And I like yeah. uh, Dean's uh, music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I love them together, and I, I love all their stuff alone, too. When did they start? Because Jerry well, I'm glad you brought them. Really, uh, really young. Uh, they, like, really young. It, they started in, well, Jerry was born in 26. So uh, they did their first movie, My Friend Irma, uh, in 49. So. And you know what? Another thing I just re recently found out, um, Jerry Lewis was taller than Dean Martin. Yeah, he was I didn't tall. know that. And he had, a, yeah. for the act, mm -hmm. he had a hunch over. And, and, and because Dean was being a straight man, had to be that... You know, yeah. a commandeering. Uh, Dean was the tough one, yeah. so he always had it was a, interesting a little bit taller. How how they had to actually, and that's vaudeville, plain and simple. How mm -hmm. they had to push the the eccentricities and also uh, minimalize certain things, and that was all part of that act. And they met in '45, and they deb debuted as a duo at Atlantic City's 500, 500 Club, Club uh, July Sk 24th, 25th, 1946. Yeah, so DeMato, that's when this probably. episode needs to be done and put out as an anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>1957, the year after he and Dean Martin ended their earth-shattering act together. This film would be his first solo role, uh, The Delicate Delinquent, directed by Don McGuire. There's some knife and gun play in it. Um, it's mm. about a, a teenage delinquent, although I think he plays a character that's 22, 23. Uh, he works for a little apartment place in, I guess it, that's L.A. It took place in L.A., right? I thought it was New York. Or was yeah, it, New York? Was yeah, it's New, York. New York? Is it New York? Yeah, because that New York police, I'm pretty sure it was New York. Because what confused me was when he gets to the police academy, it looks like I... It does, it, yeah, with the palm trees. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Unless, why I wasn't sure. You know, sure. I noticed some of, and not, not to get ahead of it, but in a lot of Jerry's movies, including this one, there's almost like a timelessness and a, and a, and a, and sometimes you really don't know where you're at. Mm -hmm. Like, it could be anywhere mm -hmm. USA. So I'm wondering if that was just done, you know, uh, intentionally, or yeah. maybe just, hey, they there was a great looking police academy mm -hmm. in LA, and yet there is that tenement housing, yeah. Brooklyn-esque 
exactly. New York feel. So I don't know unless it it was intentionally uh, uh, done to to get you know both sides mm. of the of, you know the coast. Yeah. Mean, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? But that's a great. That's something to now to rewatch it and yeah. look into. It's an urban setting. He gets involved with some street kids. Um, uh, Darren McGavin plays a police officer who takes him under his wing to try and teach him how to be a better man and eventually Jerry decides that he wants to join the police academy. The character is always misunderstood. It's misunderstood, right. uh, uh, it's a youth in this mm -hmm. case, but it could be an adult in any mm -hmm. other movie, by everyone in, in the, what we would call the established society or the establishment. And it seems like he's always having problems explaining and expressing himself and if you look at almost every Jerry Lewis movie that's that's mm -hmm. a very you know stripped down armature mm -hmm. of a lot of his movies right. and like this movie's one mouth, the yeah, whole yeah. Whole oh, movie yeah. we'll get into that you just yeah. described. Mm -hmm. and so so and and that to me is like it really struck a chord with the delic with the link with and almost like there's a, a Forrest Gump quality to it. Yes. So I'm wondering if that was even very influential mm -hmm. in Forrest Gump because here's this kid and he's just so well-meaning but he's totally misunderstood mm -hmm. he's saying the wrong things doing the wrong mm -hmm. things and the consequences are devastating in his uh, case because here he's being treated as a delinquent and he's just this mm -hmm. character unassuming just uh and i guess just trying to they never really uh get into his background but correct me if i'm wrong and he's just there, and he in this furnished room, and he lives there, and he's kind of, uh, I don't want to say slow, but I guess very insulated, mm -hmm. in the sense he's not worldly at mm -hmm. all. And he just, you know, it's almost like a small town kid yeah. being thrown in the middle of a, of, of a street. Mm -hmm. and, and he's so innocent, he'll help out anybody, including yeah. the, uh, the the burglars, you know, yeah. and, and not even realize the consequences. Well, the, the, uh, thing, the thing about it, too, is that you know, it's a film about troubled teens, mm -hmm. right? And and like your teenage years are you're between two worlds, you're between being a mm -hmm. kid and being an adult. And a lot of times you don't know what to say, you don't know who to, what pack to run with. Mm -hmm. You know, you're trying to figure this out, and, and that's I I I am sure that Jerry was like examining this film, what he was trying to say. Like that was a huge part of it. Like he wants teens who probably I'd say just back then were movie going audience as much as they are today he wanted them to understand that he kind of gets it mm -hmm. you know that's the beautiful like my favorite part uh, besides him singing on my own or you know all by myself uh, was the fact that he couldn't talk to the girl in the building like yeah. the pretty girl that liked him or anything else and that was I mean it is someone watching it today might think it was hokey or mm -hmm. cliche but I think it was definitely something that was purposefully put in there to stress this time in your life where you're like you're, you're not quite sure what you should, what would I say to her? She's so you know she's so beautiful. Why would you be interested in a person mm -hmm. like me? You know and that type of thing. And, and I really think he wanted to uh, really rip that apart and how it spreads out over all things. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, the one scene with her was so great. Like when uh, he like really tells her about himself when she's like, don't you know like any guy would love to go out with me and he's like I know that I know that mm -hmm. you know? yeah yeah and it's great. funny that scene is really cool where he like really just lays it out like and, and he calls himself a nowhere mm -hmm. nobody and, and, and yeah it's a comedy and yeah you do get your your dose of Jerry in it but um, they do try and make try and make him serious in this film especially when he gives his speech you know right. um, yeah. um, you think about it, this was really, like, you know, you look up on Wikipedia, it says this is a very important film because it's the first film we do without Dean, mm -hmm. right? So right then and there, there's film history yeah. glued on top of yep. it. Uh, and, and when you look at that, it's it's sort of almost like a reel. Like, he's got to do comedy, he's got to do serious acting, he's got to sing a song. And the only thing he didn't do was a big dance number, I guess, but he does a lot of You mean it's comedy. almost like his resume. Yeah, it's like, it's like, okay, now I, I have depth. Yeah, I now I got to show depth. everybody everything I can do in yeah. the movie. Yeah. And so they know I can do this one all by myself. Mm -hmm. you know, they Including the drama part of it, the right. serious mm -hmm. side right. of it, which nobody really knew and, about. And, and, and I'm sorry to cut you off, Chris, but um, 
getting back to all the different tenants that are in the building, you got the girl that you mentioned, you got the owner, I guess he's the owner of the landlord. That one guy, so yeah. And then he's got the he's got that <laughs> crazy the, the inventor guy. The crazy yeah. inventor guy, <laughs> guy who I think they brought in to help counteract a little bit oh, of Jerry. Because he was crazy. Like he, yeah, Jerry didn't have to be all crazy. Well, 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 I think Jerry and uh, Don McGuire, the director, and whoever else involved in the film uh, wanted to try and bring out some of Jerry's serious side, bring him down a little bit. So they brought this guy to come in to be the real crazy guy who made absolutely no sense. Uh, you know, I, I I actually started getting annoyed with the, the Venter guy. I'm like, Are you, really? Really? <laughs> this guy can actually pay his bills right, and live right. in a house and do all this stuff? And he does dance, though, or when he sings the rock and roll and brown ball. That's, oh, that's right. So he does, there he does it, it is. all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it all. it's short. It's not really that's, right. But, that's but the, the choreography thing. just with the trash cans and the knife fight is hilarious. Oh, yeah. that, if that's, that's not dancing, I mean, yeah. that's it. I mean, he, that, he's pretty much showing you everything mm -hmm. he could do at mm -hmm. that point, uh, for sure. And, and I thought that one, uh, the, the one musical number in the film that he does, uh, they, it's part him singing and part him singing as a VO. Which mm -hmm. I thought was it really interesting. I was like, I don't think I'd ever seen that before. No, nope. but another uh, thread uh, in the movie um, that isn't the only movie he does, it's that uh, he always sets that up that scenario where the common man meets the unattainable or, uh, or tries the unattainable. Not that he was that much of a common man. He was a little underneath a common man mm -hmm. in this movie, but it's that trying for the unattainable. Mm -hmm. And and and, uh, and I love the, the was the IQ test with the blocks. Oh my God, yeah. I was just thinking it's that. Like, yeah. it's and then like, he gets there, he's like, it's like, a like, different box. Right, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so will he ever get there? And you look at a lot of those movies, like the unattainable, and uh, uh, as, as cliche it is, as it is, it is a thread. And it's kind of that serious, I think it lends to that serious side where I'm a nobody, want to be a somebody. Yeah. Like, who doesn't go to bed every night at one point or another thinking that? Mm -hmm. and, and this whole movie is pretty much, I'm a nobody, want to be a somebody. Whatever that mm -hmm. right. somebody is, it's the unattainable at the point of the realization that you are you think you're mm -hmm. a nobody. And I yeah. think that's, that's a drama side of this movie. Yeah, right. and, and, and to latch onto that too is, you know, I think the reason that Jerry's films uh, are popular with kids, or parents want to share them with kids. It's like to that point with like, the gag of the box, which I absolutely <laughs> love. Absolutely love is, uh, you know, if you're a parent, you hear all the time from kids, "Oh, it's not fair," or you know, or you know, they won't go as far as saying life's not fair. That's a parent's reply. But like the kids, are like, well, this happened, and that's not fair, and and like that, like that box gag was a very poetic way of saying like, no, life is not fair. <laughs> like just when you think you've got it all figured out, it's going to change on you, and you have to roll with the punches. And, to that point, though, the, the, the IQ test thing bothered me a little bit because um, I was like, if this guy can't put these these things together, then how the hell is he going to become a cop? Yeah, it's mean, the unattainable. So yeah. And it's, it's not, it's it's not so much the task of putting the blocks in, it's how psyched out he gets about the Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's the whole true. thing through the whole movie. Yeah. He always psychs himself out. And I think eventually, himself. eventually that works because it's him just getting flustered that makes him seem stupid like, instead yeah. of him actually being stupid. Like how great is it that he delivers that baby? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I mean that's yeah. so. Like, this is yeah. the last guy yeah. you would want in a room yeah. with a woman about to give yeah. birth, and then of course it comes back. And, yeah, everything's you know, perfect and clean. But like to me, like that was a great moment. Was mm -hmm. like, yeah, he just he wasn't prepared for it. He didn't mm -hmm. think about it. He had to do it. Yeah, you know, but if you have time to think about it, again, it's like that. That's when you're gonna. But again, don't, uh, you know, I don't know what that saying is, but you know, uh, uh, we're we're you know the people who you would never think. All of a sudden, surprise you. You yeah. know, think mm -hmm. you couldn't do it, surprise you, and and that again is the serious drama side to the Jerry movie uh, I, idea with this film is that that um, with the coaching, there's that uh, between uh, the woman and, and, and the policeman and Gavin. Um, there's a lot of coaching. These people mm -hmm. who he's on the outside, they're on the inside, and. And they're trying to get him yeah. to that unattainable, mm -hmm. and they're the only ones who see it. And maybe they don't even see it, mm -hmm. but it's their ability to coach or actually be there for him when you realize he reaches a crossroad where uh, he gets involved in that uh, the gang, mm -hmm. but 
Jones doesn't realize that that's not good. And then these people start coaching him just by taking an interest in him. Yeah. So I think that lends to the serious non-comedic side. All of a sudden there's this, um, this dra- dramatic concern for this kid and uh, almost well, empathy. Empathy. Yeah. There's yeah. empathy uh, that's to- going on basically trying to rescue a life right, in some way. Right. I think it's interesting that he's wearing his ring, which is like a signature of his. I didn't even check. I don't mm-hmm. know. I he's wearing his ring, which he's going to do, but it just doesn't really go with the character. He, yeah. And like, I I'm glad you brought that, that up. I totally missed that. That is a big thing in a lot of those movies. Even when he's like playing someone who's about to get married, he'll have his wedding ring yeah, on. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, what was that all about? It's just, he just, he didn't want to take his ring off. Yeah. And I, and I, I actually think, like, I mean, I don't want to get, like, a psychoanalysis of Jerry Lewis, but like, I also think that's somehow tied to Dean. I just see Dean like as yeah. like, a very flashy, showy guy, but like he wasn't trying. And Jerry premeditated everything, you know. So, uh, but I thought it was interesting too, because like it definitely, it definitely says that's an older guy. Right. There is a Dean uh, that goes into this movie a little touch with the the Gavin police officer. There is that straight man. There's a little. Mm-hmm. There is that. Uh, yes. There it, is that. Quality. And, and she and yeah. I did want to talk about that. Yeah. Um, she mentioned we were while we were watching the delicate delinquent. She mentioned how much of a jerk Darren McGavin was, especially with the woman. And, well, uh, I watched it three times. Mm-hmm. Wow. Like, cause um, at first I felt like I wasn't really liking it, you know, and I wanted to like be into it, so I like watched it multiple times. But um, no, I came to learn that it wasn't him. That woman saw. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. She, yeah. She, she was a very annoying character. That in some was only ways. after like the first Which woman? I'm minutes. sorry, I'm lost. The, the woman that works for the police department that comes and helps. Yes. Oh, right, yeah, right, yeah. 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 Right. He was that straight man. He was that the uh, the in their act uh, the, prior to this movie, uh, uh, Dean and 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 Jerry. Uh, Jerry uh, uh, kind of had uh, his mannerisms was very chimpanzee, very monkey like. And that carried into this movie, like even with the IQ, like the way he scratches his head, even the haircut, you know, there is that almost fatherly figure, mm-hmm. but there's that monkey element. I always see that in, 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 in the caddy. The caddy, yeah. yeah. And he always played, there's a monk, his gestures are very monkey like. It could be because he was taller than Dean, always had a hunch over, but the haircut, That's the scratching it, yeah. of the head. Well, he'd always push his, with, with the nightclub act. He said oh, he used right. to always yeah. push his hair forward yeah. to look like a monkey. Right. And yeah. he, he would literally jump on the tables yeah. in the nightclub back in the day. He's like the missing link between Cro Magnum mm-hmm. and human. Yeah, exactly, you know, exactly. He's somewhere in there, and yeah. they're trying to pull him in to the rest of the society. Into the mm-hmm. human, yeah, into into the human yeah. side. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, he, when he's in front of the mirror and he's trying out different lines, what he'll say is a policeman. And oh, that's right, yeah. He says, good afternoon, ma'am. Can I help you with your car? <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's really funny. Here, in order, how do you get from one level to the next? It just You just don't wake up, and it happens. He had to work at it. You have so to imitate there, so, other people. So there it is, sometimes. yeah. There, there's the dramatic <laughs> acting mm-hmm. part of it. So here he is in the mirror uh, trying to become that... Uh, somebody, but again, um, and it takes it back to what you said earlier about him wanting to try and mimic Dean. So mm-hmm. right, right, so. and and also the perception mm-hmm. is everything. So here, yeah, you're like, how could this guy become? Well, he almost started. What do people perceive as a law enforcement authority? Mm-hmm. So he almost he didn't he missed all of the you know the, before he even got to the academy. It's like he had almost in his head get the perception yeah. there, which is interesting. So I guess that says a lot with anything. Uh, you have to work on the perception. You have to almost convince yourself that you're going to do something before you actually take the, the steps to do it. I am I enjoyed The Delicate Delinquent. Um, there were a few things in it at the bottom of me, like the IQ test and, 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 and the inventor guy. Um, I really thought it was interesting that he did that singing bit with the VO and all that. And I, I do, I really love that speech he gives. Uh, um, uh, yeah, it and really it really does pull in some of the series part about with his acting too, which I thought was cool. I'm going to give it a solid B plus uh, in that respect. I'll give it a B. Uh, I want to say first that I'm so thankful you included this film in this episode. Hey, it was your idea. I, I, yeah. I, you, you said do delicate yeah. delinquent and, and, like, and I'm and so glad you did. Because, you know, 
half the reason we do these things is to force ourselves to watch movies we always want to get to mm -hmm. and didn't. Yeah. And, and yeah. Um, I would say, like, uh, you know, I almost want to give this two ratings. For Jerry Lewis fans, I want to give it an A. Because mm -hmm. you need to see this movie, and it's important, and, and whatever. Uh, there are issues with it, and there's a little cliche, so it's, it's really like a B movie as well. But uh, I'm just because. As I'm, far as importance. Yeah, I mean. It's a prerequisite. Yeah, but it is. I mean, even, even if you're not a Jerry Lewis fan, it's, it is film history. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to say an A. And here is Chris's promo for his Digging Star Wars audio blog podcast. Digging Star Wars, the online journal of the films that inspired George Lucas to create the Star Wars saga. Please look for our next episode on diggingstarwars.blogspot.com. With that in mind, think, post, and accept my thanks for listening. In fact, this particular man happened to be the, the roadrunner that was trying to get into the hotel earlier. And if I catch him, I am going to crush his skull. And break his arms. And legs. And shoot him. Stab him. And hang him. And electrocute him. And gas him. Uh, and poison him. Right. It's 1967. Jerry comes out with the big mouth, which is... I'm not necessarily espionage, but I thought he took a lot of elements from that because when I watch The Big Mouth, I feel like I'm watching a 60s James Bond film that's shot in that style. Uh, it's a very colorful film. I don't know if you noticed how many different colors are in that movie. Yeah. It's beautiful to watch. Um, my favorite part is actually the beginning credits. The narrator, he's, he's giving mm -hmm. the narration. He turns around and starts walking. Very Monty Python-esque. Yes. And the camera, goes, Python. the camera goes up and goes swinging around during all the credits, goes all the way around, and just as it says it's directed by Jerry Lewis, it comes around and there he is sitting on the beach. Mm -hmm. One shot. Just a beautiful shot going all the way around, and there's Jerry. And, and did the you notice uh, the, where the fishing pole was? I mean, let's... I mean, I think that was totally planned. Mm -hmm. The whole uh, jerking of the fishing pole, yeah, yeah. and you know, where's this going? Like that's how that just brought you right mm -hmm, in. Mm -hmm. Like, what is he gonna pull in? Exactly. Well, yeah. And so, uh, like again, the silent movie mm -hmm. starts out as a silent movie yeah. in that respect. That it's his gesture. It's like, what is? It? I know it's a fishing pole, but like, what's he doing? The whole body action, no sound. Mm -hmm. and, and so Jerry basically gets uh, involved with a bunch of diamond smugglers and thieves and stuff like that. There's all kinds of comedians and uh, comedic actors popping up in this movie, um, and uh, Jerry has to basically try and keep himself from getting killed and all this. So plays two parts. Yeah. He actually plays three characters in this movie. Who's the third one? Well, he plays himself, and right. then he plays himself as the nutty professor guy. Uh, oh, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, when he yeah. goes to the sea world. And then he plays the, 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 yeah. the guy, the, the... The gangster guy. The gangster guy, yeah. 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 Wow. So, oh, right. so... And I thought it was interesting that he honed in on the Nutty Professor look because... Yeah, the, the nutty, buck teeth, yeah. right! The Nutty Professor right. was his, it was the one right before this one. So I think right. he just wanted to hone into that and bring a little bit of that one in. One of my favorite scenes is um, the hotel manager is looking for oh. Jerry's <laughs> The hotel character. manager guy was great. Right. Right. He was one of my favorite now characters. Now he's come out movie. as the, the geeky guy with glasses. Yeah. Oh, I see we're having a picnic. No, we are not. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Clamps. No, we, we, in fact, we are looking for someone. We're looking for someone? I hope it isn't some rowdy or something. I would hate to stay in a hotel with bad element. Bad element? Here? Oh, don't be ridiculous. We don't allow anybody like that in here. And if I catch him, I am going to crush his skull. And break his legs and arms. And shoot him, and stab him. Jerry says, and, and poison, poison him. him. And they're like, right. <laughs> <laughs> that scene is really And that funny. guy's walking around with the, the brace on his foot. Wow. Well, he keeps being mis, uh, misrepresented. He can't get story out about it. Yeah, he can't. Nobody no one will listen, listen to him. Right. That's right. right. Yes, no one will listen to him, and he can't explain what's happening to him. And, he, and he's trying to not only not get killed, but he's also trying to... Uh, bring this to a conclusion so he can move on with his life and no one will listen to all he to wants him. to do is fish. That's exactly, right. yeah. that's all he wants to do is I fish. I just came here to fish. I just came here to fish. The, the plight of this man, he cannot be understood. No matter how much he tries to explain, he can't express himself, 
<laughs> it's almost like misunderstood. It's almost like he's invisible and no one wants to pay attention to him. And how many times do you feel like that? Is that the common man? I mean, he really, I think, again, Jerry focusing in on the common human dilemma. It's you know? funny when he finally is going to tell her his problem and what happened about, like, catching a diver or whatever. Um, he says, he can't even find the words. He says, um... I called a frog man, a long, tall, living man, frog. <laughs> like, he can't even talk. Yeah, he can't even express himself. And then the part with, with the police where he's trying to say, and then all they do is argue about what... Yeah, like a 409 meter. Is it a 409 or a 310, you know? And, and, he's and, just, I'm and he drives like, off and he even knows him yeah. leaving. That's my favorite, that's my favorite scene yeah. in the movie, is, is yeah. like him threatening to leave. Yeah. I'm getting in the car now. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going. Now. I will go. I'm, I'm about to drive the off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk about no. double entendres in that like second meeting when he has the conversation with the girl, uh, the lead, his love interest, uh, and he's trying to talk about this whole problem he has. Oh yeah. And she's just, you know, and he's just saying like, you know, I have this problem, and I. And, you know, you're I, just and frustrated. And she's like, you're just frustrated. He's like, and he's like, like, you know, so if I could just get it out, it'd be fine. She's like, well, I want to help you get it out. And, <laughs> And like she's talking about one thing and he's talking about another, and I I remember like, geez, I know that there's stuff like this throughout the Jerry Lewis movies, but this was like hitting you in the yeah, face, like yeah. I am telling you, mm-hmm. this is a double entendre, and you got to get this joke. It was almost like a pop art movie in that respect, almost like The Beatles' Help and stuff. It's that again, that whole SPS cartoon like. Yeah. Yes. It had that cartoon mm-hmm. uh, pop art late '60s uh, feel, and um, uh, I was like, oh my god, it's Janine Riley. I'm a big huge Hee Haw fan. And Janine uh, Riley went on to be like, I oh, mean, I was you, wondering where I'd seen her I was before. Like, I know I'd seen her before. She's the hee haw girl. And like, oh, like, oh, and Colonel <laughs> Sanders, speaking of chicken. <laughs> that was crazy Colonel when he was Sanders. in that movie. Well, I, that made my day. And he was pissed. He was so crazy. He was an angry, mean dude. Well, I'm like, I'm glad well, I'm you know anything about Colonel anymore. Sanders. He like had no money or something, and like at a very later stage in his life, started making uh, his recipe for uh, fried chicken door to door, like literally. A gra- well, she's ground- the kid here. I had to explain to her. Yes, that's the real yeah. Colonel and, Sanders. And at that point, I don't even know if he had sold uh, to Gino's. Gino's. Uh, owned by Gino Marchetti, the football star. Mm -hmm. Colonel Sanders, it was Gino's hamburgers featuring Colonel Sanders' Kentucky Mm -hmm. Fried Chicken. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it's around this time that he was was just starting to get, maybe he made a commercial or something, but then the chicken started outselling Mm -hmm. the hamburgers and he branched off as Colonel Sanders' Kentucky Fried Chicken and Mm -hmm. Gino's was out of business. Mm -hmm. The cycle of fast food. It was yeah, in- that's like an interesting like side. And, but the graphic, and, and, but like this his, is the real guy. Yeah, his face is the same. The graphic yeah, is the they same. They still use the same graphic. And, yeah, it's and, crazy. And, and it was almost like, I mean, obviously the guy had no acting skills, but he 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 just it was almost like that man <laughs> in the street. Like yeah, just, I don't he looked pretty pissed. I don't, yeah. know. I don't think he wanted he to be there. One of the most convincing performances in that movie. Actually. <laughs> you know what? That, that was probably him. Yeah. You know, I yeah. bet that was his. I know. Was that was the only thing he knew how to do. That's kind of like. Mm. The cliche in Hollywood, when you're trying to get a picture up and running, you try to get what we call the package, which is like brand, the, the, the I'm sorry, the celebrity names attached to the project. Like, mm-hmm. Well, we got appearances by this person, this person, this person, you know, we'll, we'll have this famous celebrity make a cameo, we got this, you know, and uh, Jerry Lewis, all the, throughout his film career, he's fought for so much. So I can see him being like, well, you're going to see names of people. Mm. Give me one person that I'm going to recognize in your movie. <laughs> Colonel Sanders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you got that, Colonel Sanders? Yes, we got, we Colonel, got Sanders. Colonel Sanders. And George Takai. Yeah. yeah. So there was Harold J. Stone, Susan Bay, Buddy Lester, Del Moore, Paul Lambert, uh, Janine Riley, Leonard Stone, Charlie Callis. Charlie, Charlie Callis, Callis. That's, yeah. yeah. That's him. That's him. That's impossible. And it's funny what happens to them, uh, all the mob guys or whoever that, you know, they, when they confront, I guess, with the reality of, wait, is this guy alive? Is it the same guy? They lose their speech, mm-hmm. which is funny. Again, is it an homage to silent film? Mm-hmm. Who knows? And they have to rely on the slapstick. Mm-hmm. On and so one guy becomes a dog, which yeah. I thought was hilarious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and 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 you know, Charlie Callis does that whole mm-hmm. gibberish. He's, he's got to be, he's got to be dead. I, I know. I with the whole, I took the 
we shot with the with the whole with the whole you you I know I and the whole Janine Riley character and and Jerry as that the the, the nerd the, the misfit guy and saying all the wrong things but there is that still even in that character he wanted Janine Riley like, mm-hmm. like again the beauty and the beast the have and the have nots mm-hmm. it's it's all in this that's why I like the movie because it just slotted in well with all the other Jerry movies in that the have and the have nots and, and I wanted to mention a, a little bit on the non-comedic side but again is you know, comedy and terror, they're the same uh, many times. There is a sense of a, a, a embarrassing states of humiliation that in a lot of you thread through Jerry's films, you find that. And sometimes it's treated as comedic, sometimes not, or sometimes both at the same time. And, um, and it even borders on that uh, almost uh, sadomasochistic or masochistic side, you know, when they're just over killing that guy mm-hmm. in the beginning like blowing him up yeah. and, and, and <laughs> which I thought was and, part of the series and, and, part. yeah and, and and just shooting and there's there's a lot of um, of that almost well how much and even the guy stepping on his like how much there's a lot of pain mm-hmm. in this movie if you mm-hmm. really dissect it and is that there and and it's it's stimulating in the comedic factor because you know when in death, there's comedy. I mean, it, mm-hmm. it is all one, and and the pain is comedy. You know, embarrassment uh, is a big part. And, and of this you're movie. also talking 1967, so you're entering into that new Hollywood phase. So there was actually a lot of sex jokes. I was surprised by some yeah. sex jokes. Yeah. And, yeah. and and Jerry getting blood on his hand, and and like you said, the part where they pretty much annihilate the guy yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. You know, so. And I think a lot of it also is uh, the attraction. I mean. I, as an adolescent, I'm sure many adolescents got uh, it, still like Jerry Lewis. Or it, 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 he's almost uh, Chris. You were mentioning is that next stage, that in between stage yeah. of of you get all those jokes and like, yeah, am I suffering from arrested development? Probably sure, but we all are to a degree, and that's why I think we relate to a lot of these Jerry movies because. It, you look at them through the eyes of an adolescent, and you, there's there is those undercurrent, sex, violence. It's all in there. It's obviously much muted because it was the '60s, not like now. But but it, uh, I think that's key. That whole adolescent looking through it through this adolescent kaleidoscope view is is where I almost like to approach a lot of Jerry Lewis movies from mm-hmm. the get go, uh, not taking them too seriously. And there's a lot of awakening, and I'm gonna go out on a limb here. There is a lot of sexual awakening that happens in a lot of these Jerry films, as subtle as they were. Yeah. That's pretty racy if if you're looking at it through the eyes of an adolescent. Mm-hmm. Maybe not now, but obviously yeah, when the movie yeah. came out, yeah. it was almost like, I'll bet there's parents back then who said, you're not gonna see that Jerry mm-hmm. movie. And by the way, you're not gonna see that James Bond movie mm-hmm. either because he's even worse. Where even it, with the music. Yeah, I thought oh, the music exactly. Very and the graphics, and the graphics yeah. and everything. So, but again, uh, mm-hmm. there's something going on with, and there's all those sexual undertones uh, throughout that movie that was that I think he was he was concurrent with the times mm-hmm. right uh, I give it a B <laughs> for Big Mouth I'm gonna rate it uh, a B I, a solid B I, I loved it uh, I, it's obviously not an epic must see but I'm glad I saw it because I hadn't I overlooked it yeah. um, uh, uh, the Big Mouth to date is probably my most favorite Jerry Lewis movie um Oh, again, I no, again that's very commendable. Again, I am really light on my solo Jerry Lewis movies. Um, uh, I uh, am going with a B plus. Uh, I love how it was shot. I love the camera work. I love the colors. I laughed my ass off pretty much through I the whole too. film. I did. I'm gonna give it a C minus, and I'm gonna give it a C minus with the note that the reason it's getting that is I feel there's other films that people that are new to Jerry Lewis should see. So you start with the Nutty Professor, you go to the Bell Boy, you go to the Aaron Boy, you go to the Geisha Boy. Like, you, like you need to attack the yeah. delinquent. Like, you need to attack this large body of work mm-hmm. with the quote-unquote classic Jerry yeah. Lewis, and, and then go on. Um, no, it's funny, because, like, all the things that you, uh, not to be the party but all the things you were praising about this, like, that's, not, not specifically those things, but I really didn't feel like it clicked in this movie. I don't think, I felt watching this movie, um, that Jerry was trying so hard to catch up to the times and hold on to the past at the same time. So I felt there was a lot of classic 
bits, not just himself, but what the roles he gave to other characters. Mm -hmm. um, and it was 67, so he was trying to have that, but put it in the James Bond, you know, sexual revolution in the 60s and everything else. And to me, it, it, it got muddled and it got a little confused. And there was a point in this movie where I'm like, oh, I, just, I just want your clothes back. Like, I just want, I want this film to be that. Or just go full tilt 60s, which I'm not a huge fan of, but I'll know where I'm at. And it, it, it had its feet in two different worlds. And, uh, you know, the, the characters are repeating. You have the blonde and you have the nice girl that you know he's going to wind up with. But mm -hmm. it's going gonna, it's gonna to be awkward and painful all the way through. And, um, you know, like, that's why, like, the bit with the cops is, like, this is pure Jerry. Mm -hmm. This is very clean and very tight and well-written and well-rehearsed. Uh, and I felt like it got lost. And by the time we get to SeaWorld and the whole undercover operation and he dresses up as the Kabuki performer yeah. or whatever. You, by then you were, you were I was over. I was already frustrated with this movie. <laughs> and then, and then, and then I, I know that, like, to me, like, we've talked about this before with as far as, like, with the Mars Girls, like, what's appropriate racist humor of that era mm -hmm. and what isn't. And that, to me, was like, okay, this is going on way too long. And oh, you fact, gotta watch the, beat, the Geisha Boy. I know, I have. But, like, but to me, and to further emphasize, like, the fact that his character, when he's at his norm, is misunderstood. And then, for comedic effect, he pretends to be someone speaking a foreign language and, and mocking that language. It was a little too much for me. It was just kind of like, you've gone too, too far. Like, you need to kind of dial it back a little bit. I love the stuff with, like, the conversation with the double entendre and, like I said, the police thing, because I felt like that's pure Jerry and playing with it. Well, and love it was, American style yeah, in there, it, too. Yeah, it but was... It, and that's... And I, I, I agree with you, Chris, on the realm that it's more of a collage. It's like he took... A, he's, like, pasting it together. Right. There, and it is... When you look at that year, if you probably interview 10 people who lived through that, they probably get give you 10 different examples. Some people were like still at the surfing and Beach right. Boys, even though there were riots going on and 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 some people were into LSD. Mm -hmm. Some people were uh, still caught up in the 50s, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Some people were way ahead of the game and already into the, you know, a love American style, you know, mm -hmm. free love thing. Uh, and then, so if you just look at it that way, it's almost, I could see him sitting there and say, how do I bridge all this stuff together? And yeah, there probably is a little, there's some cracks in mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. but I think it's a pretty valiant effort to try to stay relevant. That's what I was thinking. Uh, in a, and and yeah, you're right though, it, it, if you, you splice that, the cop and the car thing, yeah, that's definitely an earlier 60s that's thing. That's old school. Right. But then, then mm -hmm. his whole conversation with uh, the, the, mean, the brunette, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and that's a total 70s sitcom thing, the whole, mm -hmm. Double yeah, entendre, right. sexual, trying to explain yourself, and the woman, I mean, and then, I mean, I'm going, he was ahead of the time with Love American Style, Partridge Family, Brady Bunch, mm -hmm. all that stuff. I thought that, that one apartment scene covered. Yeah. Even like the... Like what era is, is the monkeys and when did... That was 67, the monkeys. Yeah, because that's what I felt like this was so tr yeah. was trying to be. Was but again, that's be. a pop art. Well, that was... together, uh, you know, uh, uh, Warhol, Rauschenberg, you know, it is almost like... You'll sort of say, is it really art? Is mm -hmm. it relevant? Well, it's marketing, and and we digest it, so maybe it is art, maybe portions of it is art. So in a sense... And uh, remember Batman was he, out at right. the exact same time. Was yes. he, the same type of thing. Mm -hmm. Was yeah. he splicing this together, and maybe he wasn't totally successful, but I think successful enough that looking back on it, I think it's very enjoyable. When he does the Kabuki dancer, it's like, okay, wrap it up. Wrap yeah, it, up. it does go quickly. long. Yeah. I have yeah, a feeling he was working on that bit and decides, to, like, I gotta use it in this movie, and I guess he just kind of explored No, it I actually, because long. he's pulling from bits he's done already. Right, yeah. And yeah. he's, and he's Including changing... Including the Nutty him. Professor and guy. He's yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right, and he's changing right. him just a little bit. And I feel like he's like, well, you know, whatever. The kids these days, they didn't see that professor, so I'll, I'll give him this guy. This but isn't here. that, you know, well, every artist know. to a point has to has to almost uh, go through that phase of trying to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. Like, maybe he yeah. felt he yeah. was getting close to his swan song sure. and, and maybe he had to wrap it up. But what's interesting, I think that in so doing that, I think he did, uh, uh, it was a stepping stone into that 70s sitcom, mm -hmm. even British 
I mean, I, uh, I oh, know it's a stretch, was... the Monty Python, but I, there is a certain element that in his almost meandering about was a touchstone to, to somebody else perfecting it, maybe. Yeah, so that's it's why so, I think it's important. It's really a fusion of so many mm -hmm. Chris, I think the next time you see this movie, you need to go out to KFC, buy a bucket of chicken, and eat it while you're watching it, and you'll just see it all the way oh, And there. dress up as a kabuki dancer. Yeah. Right. And it all makes sense to you. All that Parsi hydrogenated oh. oil and everything will just all kick in, and you'll, you'll give it an A. That's a perfect ending. In honor of the release of The Amazing Spider-Man in theaters a few weeks ago, we revisit Episode 4 The Avengers. Corey Octus, Randy Petrus, and myself talk a little bit about Spider-Man with some leftover discussion pulled from The Avengers podcast for your enjoyment. Marvel actually didn't start getting into reboots till almost 2000, I guess. And honestly, Marvel doesn't do full-on universe reboots that yeah. way. They'll, they'll, they'll reboot a character specifically like they did with uh, Spider-Man. They did a storyline called um, One More Day, and in the story Aunt May was dying and he made a deal with somebody, I forget who, a uh, deal with the devil basically, to uh, get himself one more day with Aunt May, and what that did was it wiped out many years of his history and allowed, allowed mm -hmm. him to reboot the character. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. Spidey's origin story in the Ultimate Universe was very interesting to me, mm -hmm. where it wasn't just like three panels, mm -hmm. it was three issues. Mm -hmm. And they, they spread all that over, you know, where you really got the impact of like, you know, Uncle Ben dying and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Um, they, they gave him a true origin. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think for me it really, really depends on what it is they change and how much they change. Mm -hmm. um, because there are certain core elements that make that character that character. Wasn't the idea of the genetic spider in Spider-Man actually an ultimate thing? Because it was yeah, the it was... radioactive spider in the right. original. And, and so... to me, that doesn't make a whole hill of beans of difference. Yeah, I mean, I the, the radioactiveness it. versus, you know, genetic whatever. I mean, you know, it's still an altered spider. In the and it's world. kind of the 21st century way of... Yeah. Uh, explaining it, I guess. Well, yeah. I imagine it has to evolve if they want yeah. to get a younger audience. Exactly. You know, exactly. they can't be using 80s ideals. Yeah. And... When when they change things, like in the first Spider-Man movie, where they change to the organic web shooters instead of him building his web shooters, I thought that was a big change. And while the movie, I thought, handled it actually pretty well, um, where they just kind of they said it, they mentioned it, they glossed over it, and, and continued on with their story. I don't like that kind of stuff because there is a lot to the character that speaks about, like Peter Parker in particular. He's a science student. He's a science whiz. He can build this kind of stuff, and he uses in the comics. He uses his web shooters a lot um, to fight certain villains. It's like, oh, I'm going up against Electro. I'll change the mm -hmm. formula in my web shooters, right. and that'll allow me to change some stuff. And you know, he runs out of web fluid, he needs the money to buy that kind of stuff. That's a huge part of that character for, for Spider-Man. Mm. Um, when you change it, it's just, it just means that you're going to take out that element of that character and you're, you're glossing over it. That bugged the crap out of me. Yeah. Because I, if, I, I'm alright with the, the fantasy and the idea that a, a genetic or a radioactive spider gave him powers. You know, the, the clinging to buildings and stuff. And, I'm all right with that. But sure. when he's shooting webs out of his wrist organically, that makes absolutely no sense to the physiological makeup of a spider. Right. Why would why would he be he'd shoot him out of his ass, if anything? <laughs> yeah, it's true. So and, and nobody wants makes to see that. No yeah. sense. I <laughs> no, mean, uh, what, what would even be in there? That that is he shooting him out of a vein? Yeah, is no, he shooting, I, what is I, he shooting it out of? Yeah, who knows? And, and it's like if you were if your superpower was spitting on people. You'd have to remake the liquid mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah. You'd have, I mean, you'd be, yeah. Eventually, you'd be dry. You'd run out. Yeah, yeah I, I, and he'd be so dehydrated <laughs> the whole time because that's a lot of web to it's swing of, from one building to one building. <laughs> yeah. Keep your eyes out for part two of the serious side of Jerry Lewis in episode six of the Dying Breed Movie Club meets the movies. Creative consultant Chris Mitch. Technical Director, Rich Shoemaker. Special thanks to Carolyn Walker, Al Jones, and me, Paula Burke.
The Dying Breed Movie Club Meets the Movies is produced by Deep Lake Pictures Entertainment and has no connection to any of the movies, artists, or motion picture companies seen or discussed in The Dying Breed Movie Club Meets the Movies whatsoever. Copyrights for films, images, sound bites, trademark characters, and related materials discussed in The Dying Breed Movie Club Meets the Movies remain with their respective owners. All materials are solely used for criticism, discussion, and artistic interpretation based on the fair use laws of the United States.